This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Global Institute of Sustainability and a generous investment by Julie Ann Wrigley. Wrigley Lecture Series. World-renowned thinkers and problem solvers engage the community in dialogues to address sustainability challenges. So um, before we get started, and thank you all for coming out this evening, my name is Jacob Moore. I'm the Assistant Vice President of Tribal Relations for Arizona State University. I'm an enrolled member of the Thon Otham Nation in Southern Arizona. I'm also Akhmer Otham from Gila River, and then my mother is from Montana. So I'm Lakota, Dakota. My mother's from uh, Fort Peck in Northeastern Montana, and my grandmother's from Cheyenne River in South Dakota. So again, thank you for joining us. My name is Christopher Boone. I'm the Dean of the School of Sustainability. And on behalf of the Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening. I just want to say a couple of words about this series. The Wrigley series is the result of a lot of hard work of our faculty, student, and staff. And we spend a lot of time, months, uh, in advance thinking about who we can invite to campus who we think are the most compelling thinkers and doers in sustainability and we reserve the Wrigley speaker series specifically for people of that uh, stature people who have inspired many others in the work that we try to do in sustainability and certainly our featured speaker tonight certainly fits that bill um, but I, I'm going to ask Jacob to come back up again because uh, he will be giving the introductory remarks to our featured speaker tonight. But I just wanted to let you know that we are very proud to have you here as one of our speakers. And I want to thank all of you for coming. So thank you, uh, Dean Boone and also uh, Royce for the blessing this evening. Again, uh, as he mentioned, we are in the uh, ancestral land of the Akhmeratham and the Pipash. And I really appreciate working for a university that will acknowledge that, that will recognize that. We have a Native American advisory uh, committee made up of some of our senior faculty. And uh, they do have the opportunity to share with the president's office the concerns, uh, the, 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 the the dreams, the, the issues within our communities. We have 22 tribes in Arizona. And uh, about a year ago, we had asked the president's office for a letter acknowledging where we're located. So President Crow had issued a letter uh, stating that we are in the ancestral lands regardless of which campus we're on, and that it's important to recognize uh, where this place is and what it meant to those that were here before, still here now, but here long before. And uh, what the letter also said was, our deans, our, our professors, our staff, our faculty are also responsible for every student, every American Indian student that's on this campus. So I'd like to ask those students if they could please stand and be recognized. Do we have any ASU students here tonight? So. So this is really what it's all about. I mean, and again, I, it, this is an important evening, but I think it's also important that we know that, uh, that we are also here to support our future, uh, that obviously we're in a difficult time. You know, we're in a time where, you know, the uh, leader of the free world is, is corresponding with us by tweets. Um, <laughs> and it's really important to have people like uh, La Winona LaDuke to know that we still have intelligent people. Uh, <laughs> that we have real thinkers, uh, that we have people that care about the environment, about our communities, about our way of life. And so with that, I'm gonna keep my introduction short, but I do wanna just make sure that I give a proper introduction to Winona LaDuke, who's an environment, environmentalist, a political activist. She is internationally renowned activist, working on issues of sustainable development, renewable energy, and food systems. She lives and works on the White Earth Reservation in uh, northern Minnesota and is a two-time vice president presidential candidate 
with Ralph Nader for the Green Party. As program director for uh, Honor the Earth, she works nationally and internationally on the issues of climate change, renewable energy, and environmental justice with indigenous communities. And in her own community, she is the founder of the White Earth Land Recovery Project, one of the largest reservation-based nonprofit organizations in the country. And she's also a leader on issues of culturally-based sustainable development strategies, renewable energy and food systems. And in this work, she also continues national and international work to protect indigenous plants and heritage foods from patenting and genetic engineering. She is a graduate of Harvard and Antioch Universities. She has written extensively on Native American and environmental issues. She is the former board member of Greenpeace ASU, I don't say ASU, sorry about that, and Greenpeace USA. It's my dyslexia, so go devils. <laughs> and is presently an uh, advisory board member for the Trust of Public Lands, Native Lands Program, as well as board member of the Christiansen Fund. She is the author of five books, including Recovery, Recovering the Sacred, All of Our Relations, and a novel, Last Woman Standing. And more recently, her most recent book is Winona LaDuke's Chronicles. So she is widely recognized for her work on environmental and human rights issues. And please give a warm welcome to Winona LaDuc. That was a very big introduction. Thank you. Really honored to be here with you today. Thank you very much for the opening as well, the prayer. Ani Nindewe Maganaduk, hello my relatives. Bine Sikwe and Jinikaz, Makwandodam, Gawababani Ka, Gish Kanaganing and Dunjaba Migwich. Thank you again for the honor of being here. Um, I rewrote my notes so that they were tidy. They were kind of scribbly. Um, this month in our language is called uh, Ona Banagizis, which is the hard-crusted snow moon. And then Iskigami Zikigizis is the one that follows that. It's the maple syruping moon. But it came early this year because of climate change. We're all sapping now up north. And then uh, we have Wabaganagizis, that's the flower moon. Odeimanagizis, the uh, strawberry moon. Mean Gizis, the blueberry moon. Then we have a moon called uh, Mano Manike Gizis, the wild rice making moon. Those are some of the moons in my language. I thought you might like to hear it. And um, I, I want to say, I don't know if any of you noticed that none of those is named after a Roman emperor. <laughs> Did you guys all get that? So I just want to say, uh, you can take a break from all that empire stuff. It's going to be OK. Just let some of it go. It's like a big burden to carry around, a lot of karmic stuff. Might be okay, let it go. I liked how you said take a breath, you know, because that's what I was thinking, because I come down here and I feel like everybody's always like in a really big hurry down here. Like build more, do more, make more of this, you know? And sometimes I feel like we just should like take a breath. Like maybe we don't need to do all that stuff, which I think is kind of this moment, a little bit about this moment. So um, this is a piece of art that we have, I, and this is Kim Smith who's a Diné woman, and she's one of my board members. And um, this is an art show called The Art of Indigenous Resistance that, we, we, that she curates. And it's traveling around, and I, and I really like it. And I like that piece, and that's me and her and, at an opening. But um, you know, to me, this is this interesting time that we are in. And um, as I reflect on this moment and uh, the first 100 days of, of the big guy in DC, and I think about like his plan and then what the plan is we need. I think we really need something more like the sitting bull plan. That's what we need. And we need something where we, you know, where we put our minds together to see what kind of future we can make for our children. And that's our moment. And as I, as I reflect on that and, and as I think about that, you know, I ask the question that probably a lot of you might ask is, what's it going to be like 50 years from now here, 100 years from now? 
Where's your water coming from? Where's your food going to come from? What are we going to be thinking? Are we going to be conscious thinkers? Will we be creative and beautiful people? Will we, you know, treat each other well? You know, those are really the questions that we need to ask in our society. And I reflect on that a lot because I, I think that those are really things that we need to decide. And I don't feel very confident about relinquishing control over all of that to pretty much the guys in DC or you know, a lot of these other guys. Because uh, I don't think they'll make good decisions. We don't have an experience with them making good decisions. But then that requires us to have agency, to take responsibility for those decisions and to, and to do the right thing. You know, and not just to talk about it, but to, to do it. You know, this is the just do it speech, really. No, not quite, but yeah. something like that. But you know, one of my friends, uh, Mike Wiggins, he's a um, former tribal chair of the, of the Bad River Reservation in Wisconsin. And one day I was, he was fighting a big mining company. And uh, those guys scrapped it out on that mining company. Like, they have like three or four big battles they won big mining company that was up, upstream for them. And they, he said he'd been down to the, the legislature in, in Madison, Wisconsin, and, and he'd come back and he shook his head. He says, seems like those guys don't want to hang around another thousand years. You know, and it really made me think, because whether it is the Tohono O'odham or the Diné or all of us, we come from people who live here for thousands of years, thousands of years. So as I reflect on where we are and where we're going, you know, this is where I come from, my village. This is my lake, Gawawie Gama, Ground Lake. It's funny, in the history books, it says that the last Indian uprising in Minnesota was on that lake. We stopped them from stealing our trees. And I always say, no, we ain't done yet. <laughs> you know, I always hate that last Indian uprising thing, you know what I mean? It seems like uh, really short-sighted, you know, not reflective. <laughs> So that's where we live. And this is where I think we are. It's a piece of art by uh, you know, uh, Roy Thomas, he's deceased. But I always like to talk about the paradigm of knowledge, which I think some of the professors here discuss. And in that, you know, um, when I was an undergraduate at Harvard University, if you wanted to study the art from Europe, you went to the fine arts department. But if you wanted to study the art of indigenous people, you went to anthropology. And I think that there's a very significant kind of valuation of knowledge that comes from that. But this is our art. This is, we are all in this together and we use this for this gathering that I just hosted of about 90 Ojibwe leaders uh, to talk about the black snakes, the pipelines coming our way. You know, because we know that we are all in this together. But let us talk about when America was great. I have a totally different idea than that other guy. You know, my feeling is when America was great was when there were 8,000 varieties of corn. You know, that's when America was great. And all of that corn, a lot of that corn, the seed selection was by women. Because women are really good at that because we know like how it, how it, you know, it, it is when you're processing it and how it cooks and how it keeps, right? So that was like before Monsanto, right? That was like nobody in a white coat. You know, that was like, and a lot of the world's agriculture is practiced like that. You know, that's when America was great, when we had 8,000 varieties of corn. America was great when we had 250 species of grass in the Northern Plains. Tremendous biodiversity and with it 50 million buffalo. That's when America was great. America was great when you had maple syrup and wild rice throughout our territory. And America was great when you could drink the water from our rivers. And I really liked what Harlan Bearhand said today. He was talking about how in the, that you used to be able to go take your horses and you could dig down and the spring would fill. The water would fill from the spring because it was close to the surface. And you can no longer do that here. You can no longer do that in many places. But where I live, you can still drink the water from a lake. That's where I live. I live in a place where if you go into the boundary waters, you can still drink the water from a lake. And the springs on our reservation you can still drink from. They are good springs. I live in a place where we have so much wild rice that we can feed our people. And we still have fish. And we have um, worked very hard to fight for that. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story of my past four years. You guys hung out with me for a few minutes. I'm like, basically, I'd like to be a writer and a gardener and hang out with my horses. And now I want to raise, go I want to have, make goat cheese. That's like my bucket list, right? Like, that's my idea of what I should do. 
you know, but I've spent a lot of time fighting stupid projects. A lot of my life has been doing that. And you know, I'm an economist by training. And as I look out there in the economic choices that we face in the world, there's some really dumb decisions that are made. And they continue to be made by people who make dumb decisions. But those dumb decisions include a set of oil pipelines. And so what's happened is, is that in the past you know, 15 years, they've come up with this mythology of American self-sufficiency. And instead of buying oil from the country that has the largest oil reserves in the world, which is Venezuela, not Saudi Arabia, it's Venezuela, we retooled the whole energy infrastructure of this country to get oil from places it's really hard to get oil from. And we've entered this era which is known as extreme extraction. And what it means when you're kind of at the bottom of the barrel is that you have to do things like drill 20,000 feet under the ocean, right, to get oil. That's not like gushing oil wells in Oklahoma anymore. That's like scary stuff. And it works out until that deep water horizon, right? Then you gotta do stuff like frack. Frack everything, 602 chemicals, bust up the bedrock of Mother Earth, that stuff, right? And then you do stuff like um, the tar sands. So about four years ago, the Enbridge Company announced a pipeline project that would cut through, as you see, the northeast corner of my reservation. And that pipeline project was called the Sandpiper. And the Sandpiper was a fracked oil pipeline of 640,000 barrels a day that was to come from the fracking fields of North Dakota. And we didn't know anything about it. You know, and I was like, dang, you know, and it's like kind of broadsided me, blindsided me. And I like said, said I'm going to study up. So I studied up. I spent a lot of time educating my own people, my own community, my tribal governments in the region, because it would affect a lot of us. And plus, we have these extraterritorial treaty rights, which is that we harvest throughout that territory. And so we, you know, we spent a lot of time. And then I spent a lot of time getting, I always say, getting the Norwegians mad. Because who lives in the North Country is a lot of Scandinavians. And I was like, y'all, check this out, you know? And so over four years, we built this multiracial alliance, you know, and uh, we all, we went to every hearing, we went to every hearing. We challenged them. I challenged Enbridge to many debates. They never took me up, you know, but we, we intervened in every process. We, you know, took over the media. We, you know, because we have the moral high ground. It's an oil company that wants to you know, risk us for its profits. We don't produce oil, we're just the conduit. And we already had this set of pipelines that were going through our territory that none of us knew much about. So we fought them for four years. Uh, about a year and a half ago, Friends of the Headwaters filed a lawsuit, some non-Indian people, uh, saying that the state should do an environmental impact statement on that. The state didn't want to, appealed the court case, and then finally the court ruled, the Minnesota Court of Appeals ruled that they had to do an environmental impact statement. At this point, four years in, Enbridge's plans were kind of uh, disheveled, a little bit problematic. I understand we cost them $600 million. And uh, so, um, and at the same time, we, you know, I want to say we did this, but we also did a lot of ceremonies. And uh, that's why I, I really appreciated that, that prayer with the water, because we're water people. But we prayed, you know, we had a lot of our ceremonies about this, and, um, and we rode our horses. I rode our horses against the current of the, of the oil. We rode the hundreds of miles, hundreds of miles on the proposed pipeline route. And one day after our last ceremonial and spiritual ride against the current of the oil last year, one day after, on August 2nd, the Enbridge Company announced that it was withdrawing all of its applications to go forward with that pipeline. And that was a big victory for our people. That was a big victory for our people. <clears throat> and so, um, we felt good about it, and then the next day we find out that what they had done is purchased 28% of the Dakota Access Pipeline, which is the pipeline that would go through the Standing Rock Reservation. And so uh, we had already known something about that pipeline, and my organization, Honor the Earth, had been out there starting in April working with the Sacred Stone Camp and uh, working in the community. So uh, we said, well, that's, if it's not good for us, it's not good for them either. So we followed them out there. We followed that company out there. And in buying 28% of that pipeline, we felt that they bought quite a bit of the liability. And so early on, I approached the Enbridge company and I said, you know, you want to do business with Indian people. You know, I mean, they, uh, you know, in our story, they tried really hard to talk to us, Enbridge did. And uh, so they had these guys, I know that they have them down here, they had these guys called the tribal relations specialists <laughs> that they sent to talk to all the tribes, the tribal relations specialists. We refer to them as the Indian whispers. Right. And they like had no game, 
they got nowhere. They got nowhere, you know. And then, uh, so then, but then they gave me this other person to talk to called the Indian listener. That's how we referred to her. So I said, uh, I was in a meeting with the Indian listener. I said, uh, you know, I said, uh, they, I said to them, I said, uh, you guys moved to North Dakota. You didn't even tell us. I said, I feel like you, you dumped me. You know what I'm saying? For four years, they told us it was an essential route, that they had to do it this way. There was no other way to do it. There was no other way to go around us. And then one day, dumped. I went to North Dakota. I said, how's that working out for you? <laughs> they said, there's a lot of Indians out there. I said, there's more coming. There's more coming. And so um, that is how I became involved in the Dakota Access Pipeline. And this is what it looked like. A lot of you were probably up there, actually. How many of you went out there to Standing Rock? That's cool. Thank you, thank you all for going. Thank you. Thank our water protectors, you know? Thank our water protectors. And uh, thank you to, for those of you who supported us. Because uh, I took home some really cool Navajo squash that some of you set up. I don't know. Like, it was sitting there. I was like, can I have that? <laughs> it's like long. It's like a cool looking squash. I know it came from it was some Navajo farm. But uh, this is what we saw up there, you know, and you know this. And this is what's wrong, you know. This is what's wrong that the people who are trying to protect some water are faced with, you know, North Dakota. And we call North Dakota, we call it the Deep North. We call it the Deep North, and I think a lot of people saw why after they went up there, you know? And how that happened is, it happened for a lot of reasons, but over the past 50 years, nobody's really gone in North Dakota, and they had like this constant depopulation, and you ended up with a lot of kind of older Scandinavian farmers whose kids were now living in cool places like Phoenix, Minneapolis, and Berkeley, and they were coming home. And then, uh, you know, things were, and, and the Native community kept growing, and uh, every racial statistic you don't want to have, they had. You know, incarceration rates, 11 times that for non-Indians, you know, everything. It's just like really bad what's going on out there. Disparities in sen sensing, sentencing. And then the Bakken came. And the Bakken was kind of like the S of oil boom. It came, and they thought that that would be the answer to their problems. But, you know, it wasn't the answer to their problems. And when this pipeline came through, uh, North Dakota really wanted to protect what they perceived was their interests. You know, my problem here is, is that, look, you know, I saw things out there I shouldn't have seen. I saw this. You know, this is when they put the dogs on our people. Put the dogs on our people. And I saw this, you know, which is when they sprayed our people in the water with mace, with tear gas. And I saw this, which is called an MRAP, a mine-resistant armored personnel carrier. Now, to the best of my knowledge, there are no landmines in North Dakota, right? You know, so there's no reason that you should have an MRAP in North Dakota. There's really not a building that would justify that. I asked someone who was in the military, and they said that's kind of for plowing through the side of a building. And I was like, there's no buildings in Morton County that need that. You know, it's a really rural, rural, rural area. And that was rough, you know? And that other, building's, that other piece of equipment is called an LRAD. It's like a long-range acoustic device as to bust up your eardrums, you know? And so that's what uh, they did to our people, you know? And all of this, this is what happens when Department of Homeland Security and the military surpluses equipment to police departments. They get stuff they shouldn't have. And there needs to be a lot more monitoring of what these police departments have because they tried a lot of stuff on us. And we don't even know the full extent of what they tried on our people. You know what I'll tell you is I didn't take any bullets. I didn't take any bullets, but my family took some bullets, you know? I didn't take any of that stuff, and I didn't get arrested. A lot of my people got arrested. A lot of my people got arrested. And uh, you know, I feel like that the question is, is like, why this all happened? And how did we get to this place? And it's you know, been a slow creeping, and it is going to augment right now, where the rights of corporations supersede the rights of people. And that's what's happened, because corporations are considered natural persons under the law. You know. But what happened is that when you know, we had a meeting with Enbridge, they came back to northern Minnesota, and I'm now facing a, a 760,000 barrel a day pipeline. And uh, they had their first meeting here in December. And it was right after the, a lot of people had come back from Standing Rock. And they had a meeting in Bemidji, and there was a landowner meeting. And they thought, I think they thought there'd be like 20 white guys there or something, but they were wrong. And there was like 100 Indians there, you know, because we're landowners too. You know? And so they had a small room, it was about like that size, and they had no chairs in it, and 
one of my relatives was up against a wall with her oxygen tank, like not even a chair for that elder, you know, like that's how crazy they were. And uh, a certain point, uh, you know, someone asked me to say something, and so I said, uh, hey, Embridge, <laughs> it's like, they just know me. I was like, hey, Embridge, we got a question to ask you. I said, we were all out in North Dakota, because like about 40 people in the room were water protectors. I said, we were in North Dakota, and we saw what happened there. And we feel, you know, you know I, I called you, Embridge. It was such like a dysfunctional relationship. I called them, I texted them, I wrote them. I said, you need to demilitarize that. You need to call off the dogs. You, Embridge, who talks about wanting to work with Native people, you need to do an EIS. You have the influence you just put in 28% of their funding. You need to tell them to not fire bullets at us. I called them. I talked to the Indian whisperer, Indian listener. They did nothing. So I said to Embridge, I said in this meeting, it was like my big girl voice, I was like, hey, Embridge. Hey, Ambridge, we want to know. That's what I said to him. I said, hey, we were all out there in North Dakota. We all saw what you did. We all saw those bullets. We all saw those tanks. We all saw those water cannons. We all saw that tear gas. So we feel that you're responsible for 28% of it. We think you're responsible for 28% of the bullets, 28% of the you know, injuries. And we want to know what you're going to do here. Are you going to bring your tanks? You know? So that almost got me arrested. It was a fabulous moment. But then two big Indian girls grabbed me on the side and said, she's not going anywhere. <laughs> that was it. But you know, this is this time that we are in. And you have to be courageous to face them down, you know. And Enbridge is not pleased. They're very worried about us, you know. That's when the night of the water cannons. And this is when, you know, just when it was still peaceful out. And this is when they're leaving. I just wrote this story called The Filth of North Dakota because they talked about cleaning up at the garbage at the camp. And you know, I said, if you had let our people get out of there when there wasn't in the middle of snowstorms and blizzards, if you let us got out, get out of there, we would have been good, you know? But they bulldozed and they took like tens of thousands of pounds of food and dumped it in dumpsters rather than distributing it. Just hateful, it was hateful. And I was with LaDonna Allard from a Sacred Stone Camp when this photo came out and she said, they're burning everything, she said, but our people burn it. She said they burned it out of grief. She said our, be our people burn their teepees out of grief. They burned everything, you know? And so for me, like, I am not someone that has amnesia. And most Native people do not have amnesia. We have long oral histories of what happened, you know? I don't have ecological amnesia either, which is what a lot of people have. Like, they forgot that there used to be water there or they forgot there used to be trees there, or they forgot that there used to be something beautiful there. I don't have that, and I don't want to have it. You know, and I don't think any of us do. I think we want to be the people that remember and live that life, you know? So I remember them people. And when I think about what we're all fighting about out there, this is this era of ex extreme extraction. And so we're at the bottom of the barrel. That's the same thing up at Chaco Canyon. In every place, it's the bottom of the barrel. It's the bottom of the barrel. And so in North Dakota, the thing that really makes me angry, aside from everything else that makes me angry in North Dakota, is this. So the average drilling rig in North Dakota, uh, the average drilling rig lasts, the average, uh, well, it's about four years because it's the bottom of the barrel. And so they gotta keep drilling, like that's production. They gotta keep drilling to keep opening up more oil. And that's why it's so expensive. And they have to have a really high price of oil in order to get that. And so the thing that, you know, about this is, is that today in North Dakota, there's an 85% drop in drilling rigs. It's busted. The Bakken is busted. They laid off 13,000 people. They sent them home. The man camps are empty, right? The man camps are empty. The camps that brought us this, you know, was a billboard out in North Dakota a couple of years ago. They're empty. And so what I'm trying to figure out is this, is that Lynn Helms, he's kind of like my nemesis, he's the commissioner of mines in North Dakota. And Lynn Helms, he, uh, he published this you know, interview and he said that in 2017, there's gonna be 900,000 barrels of oil coming out of the Bakken. 900,000 barrels of oil of Bakken coming out of the Bakken. And he said and in 2019, there's gonna be 900,000 barrels of oil coming out of the Bakken. So no jump in production. And in order to like restart the Bakken, 
It doesn't just like restart. It takes a little while. There's lag time, right, in drilling. So without getting too technical, what I'm saying is there's 900,000 barrels coming out now, and there's 9,000 barrels, 900,000 barrels of oil coming out now, and 900,000 barrels of oil coming out in 2019. And so what I'm trying to figure out is how they're going to fill a 570,000 barrel per day pipeline. You understand what I'm saying? Like there's not no there's no massive jump that would have required running over all those people. All those people losing their eyes, losing their arms. You know, one of your Diné women lost an eye, right? Yeah, Vanessa. You know, nothing required that. And that's this moment, you know, and I believe it's a Selma moment. I think it's a Selma moment when people said, we're done. We are not afraid of you. We're going to stand here and you're going to try to beat on us and we're going to stand here. So what I want to say to those, you know, those of you that are here is like a couple things. We want justice. We want justice. And there's a couple of things about justice and what it looks like. So I'm going home here in a couple days and I'm going back to North Dakota. So I'm going to a trial because 750 people are facing charges in North Dakota. And some of them are probably from down here. And the National Jury Project surveyed the jury pool in Bismarck, right? The jury pool, they surveyed the jury pool to see what bias was. 82% of the jury pool in Bismarck believes that they're guilty, right? You know, these people are not gonna get justice in North Dakota. But it's this time of reckoning in North Dakota. And so I'm gonna be part of that reckoning because at some point they gotta come clean on what happened. At some point we gotta have justice. And for those of you who have people that were arrested or if you were arrested, go back to trial. Go to trial, but bring your people with you. And I want to see some of them like the Freedom Riders. You know what I'm saying is I want people to go to the trials and I want North Dakota to see our faces, to see our faces. You know, because they need to be held accountable. They can no longer live in this little like fiefdom of, of you know, oil regulatory capture. You know, I know you got it in New Mexico too, you know? It's the same thing, you know? Oil companies should not run our democracies. And that's, you know, really it. So I'm just saying, like, as you think of, of, your, of your schedule, see if you can get to North Dakota at some point. Spring is breaking. <laughs> it's okay to go back. So this is my sister. I always say, if you don't want to talk to me, you can talk to my sister. Uh, she spent a lot of time out there. Did you meet her out there? Are you out there? She's like 6'2", right? She's like the, uh, the Genghis Khan of the Ojibwe women. <laughs> she's not much on talking about it. She's more on doing about it. So you probably just want to talk to me. Let's put it that way. But anyway, so, um, you know, she's, uh, you know, this is like what we are looking at and where our resistance is at. And, um, you know, I don't need to give you the lecture on climate change, but this is this moment. And in our prophecies, we talk about this as the time of the seventh fire where we say that we, as Anishinaabe people, have a choice between two paths. These prophets told us this a long time ago, and they said we had, there's a choice between two paths. And one path, they said, was well-worn but scorched. And the other path is not well-worn, and it's green. And we were told it was our choice upon which path to embark. And I really feel like that's pretty much where we're all at. You know, we've seen a lot of scorching. And y'all don't need the lecture on this one, but you know, there you go. There's some scorching. Navajo generating station, another set of scorching. You know, all the CO2, we are combusting ourselves to the edge of oblivion. And one of the problems that we face in this is that, you know, unless you've been watching too much Fox News, you know, this is what's going on, right? And, uh, you know, the ice is melting. This is what's happening to the ocean. It's acidifying, right? And this is, this is climate change in Alaska Native Village. I was, I was visiting this one uh, young woman. Um, she's from northern Manitoba, and they've been flooded out for like five years. And the Canadian government, in its infinite wisdom, has put like entire villages in like hotel rooms, apartment complexes in Winnipeg from climate change. They say that by 2020, the price tag for climate change is going to be 20% of world GDP. Like, I have no idea, but that's like three years from now, right? And what I'm saying is, is like, it's pretty damn expensive already. 
you know, when we start quantifying it. So I don't know who's supposed to pay that. You know, I got an idea who should be paying for it. You know, Exxon, Ambridge. That's who should be paying for that, right? This is what your ocean looks like on acid. So kind of this is, you know, where we're at. And I just have to talk about this for a minute. It's like I've lived my entire life in the fossil fuels era. I've had a blast. You know, Manny, you had a blast too, right? We drove everywhere, right? I, mean, I drove everywhere. And you know, I mean, I used to go to drive-in movies. Remember those? No? Yes, yeah, some of you did. That was fun, you know? So um, in this, I've had a great time. Um, and uh, I've, you know, I've consumed half the world's known oil supplies in my life. It's been a blast. What I want is an elegant transition out of it, right? I want an elegant transition out. And what has happened is, is that because our society is so inefficient and so addicted to fossil fuels, we behave like a big addict, you know? And so what an addict does, I know some of you have addicts in their family. Like I only have one addiction, which is caffeine, my cup of coffee. You know, I just like, I really like it, you know, and I'm gonna stick with it. But you know, like addicts are kind of a drag. You know, they rationalize things, right? It's like never their fault. Did you ever notice this? It's like totally never their fault, right? If something happens and they're like, no, they did that, you know? They behave badly, sometimes they steal, they beat people up, you know, they do bad stuff, right? Bad stuff, and that's kind of what we've become, you know? You know, it's kind of like, you know, we're so addicted to fossil fuels that we rationalize our behavior. You know, we end up invading countries for fossil fuels. We bust up the bedrock of Mother Earth for fossil fuels. We, you know, have this like fantasy of some kind of a green transition through natural gas that's fracked. I mean, that is like not it, you know? And then they come up with all these other fantasies. I like the carbon sequestration fairy plan. You know, the carbon, you know, that we're gonna take it and like put it under the ocean or up in space. You, you have been watching these things, right? Billions of dollars being spent on the carbon sequestration plan. And I, I believe that this carbon sequestration fairy lives next to the nuclear waste ferry. <laughs> like there is no, it's not, you don't get to do that. You got to not make the mess, you know? So like this is this moment that we're in and in it, what happens is that, you know, it's kind of like being a junkie and then letting the drug dealers write your laws. That's what we got. You know, that's what we got in North Dakota. And I know you got it down here. I mean, there's this great thing in North Dakota they just passed called Technically Enhanced Naturally Occurring Radioactive Materials. Technically Enhanced Naturally Occurring Radioactive Materials. And that sounds like positive, right? Technically Enhanced. You know, what it is is fracking waste. And they just allow the increase, they recommended daily, or they increase the allowance from five picocuries per liter to 50 picocuries per liter that you could put in certain landfills. You know, I went to the first hearing and I said, are you guys high? You know, at no point did the recommended daily allowance of radiation increase, right? But that's what happens when you're an addict. You rationalize your industry, you make up for them, you increase the background levels for all your studies, right? That's what's going on, we, we gotta quit. So, how I know things are gonna change is a couple things, so we're gonna keep working on it. Now, this is the, the big guys aren't doing so good, which I didn't really realize until I was reading some geeky report, which is, okay, so look at this. The past five years, these companies, it's like kind of the end of the fossil fuel era. And how I know it's the end is stuff like this. So, in 2011, as you see, these guys, the big three, Exxon, Chevron, and ConocoPhillips, made 80.4 80 billion in net income, right? And then look at this, 2016, 3.7 billion in net income, right? Oh no, the Koch brothers, I guess, I guess they just bought you guys a new building or something, they're on this list too, so place, <laughs> sorry. But, um, you know, so these guys are not, they're not doing so good, so, so if you went, like, you know, ExxonMobil went from about 40 billion in net income down to about 2.8 billion in net income. If you lost that much of your company's assets over five years, you probably couldn't get a job anywhere, right? Probably couldn't get a job anywhere, except if you go to work for the smartest guy in the world, and that would be Donald Trump. And that's what Rex Tillerson, the former CEO of Exxon, just did, and he's our new Secretary of State, right? But my point in this is, is that he wouldn't even make it on The Apprentice, 
like that, right? But he gets to go work for us. He's our big guy now, right? So this is you know, what it looks like. This is where we're going, though. This is what we all needed to be living in in North Dakota. This is like the foundation for a manned and earth watch. And how I know that the fossil fuel era is ending is, is a few things. I mean, first of all, things are not going well for these guys. Second of all, if you look up at the, uh, Shell just jumped out of the, uh, Shell just left the uh, tar sands, closed up a really big project up there. I think you see how much it was a huge project that they just closed up and the Shell pulled out $8.5 billion. They just moved out the divestment movement uh, now, according to the UN Secretary General, the divestment movement is uh, up at $3 trillion, something like that, um, divesting out of fossil fuels. And um, these guys with their really brilliant plans, you see all those pipelines that, that uh, Donald Trump just approved, kind of the willy-nilly approving of pipelines, right? Trans, you know, you know, he approved Keystone, right? He wants that one all back. And, and then in Canada, they approved three pipelines. They, they didn't approve it, the Gateway Pipeline, but they approved Line 3. They approved the uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline, which is out of the tar sands, and they approved Energy East. And uh, what I know is that all of the pipelines they approved out of Canada exceed the amount of oil that they're producing. And the projections for additional production in the tar sands are increasingly lower each year as climate change regulation moves in and divestment moves. And so you could be the guy who thinks you're the most powerful guy in the world, but you can't actually make oil for your pipelines. It's not there. And so it's really important as we move ahead you know, into divestment to keep pushing ahead with that because they may have con taken control of the political system, but he does not control the whole economic system. And so as I look at what that looks like, you know, in North Dakota, not only does justice look like the 750 water protectors get justice, but if you took the $3.9 billion that was spent on the Dakota Access Pipeline and spent it on cool stuff, you could have bought 62,000 PV panels, or five kilowatt PV units for houses, 62,000 of them. And you could have bought 323 two megawatt wind turbines. Right? And you could have put 160,000 solar uh, heating panels on North Dakota houses or houses anywhere. So $3.9 billion, you could spend it on one pipeline, or you could actually have energy self sufficiency. Right? And it's the same thing with what we're facing. We looked at the same figures, and you know, we could do twice as much as that in my community. And so to me, it's this rather, it's this moment. You know, we have a country that has a D in infrastructure. We got crumbling gas mains. You got 50-year-old pipelines all over this country that are exploding and leaking. You got bridges that fall down. You got roads that are falling apart. You know, you got all kinds of bad, crazy stuff, right? We have a D in infrastructure, and we're like the first world country, right? And so you could either spend it on people, or you could spend it on corporations. In northern Minnesota right now, I have 300 miles of pipe sitting there from a pipeline they're never going to build. And my position is, is you should send those pipes to Flint, Michigan, because that's who needs pipes. We don't need those pipes, you know? So this is not a jobs versus the environment thing. This is a let's put union people to work building infrastructure that makes sense and is not going to be a liability for all of us 10 years from now or 20 years from now. And this is what the future looks like. You know, do something cool like this. I worked on this project, which is at um, the uh, Navajo Tribal College at Shiprock, 25 kilowatts of solar. It was uh, leveraged with funds from uh, the now defunct Mojave Generating Station. Worked on that project, leveraging funds. This is what a sustainable economy looks like. This is my reservation. That's wild rice. All you gotta do is take care of your ecosystem and it shows up every year millions of pounds. You know, if you were us, you'd be saying that's worth fighting for, right? You know, Creator gave us that rice. And that's, that's who I work for, those guys, right? This is what a sustainable economy looks like. You decouple your agriculture system from fossil fuels. 
Today, about 25% of our fossil fuels is used on agriculture, whether it's shipping it around or slathering it on. A lot of our tribes have, like, you know, the NAPI, all these projects, a lot of these tribal projects are fossil fuel intensive. And one of the things that I can never really understand, frankly, is how you get something like, you know, I mean, to me, you put, like, pesticide, herbicide, fungicide, all that stuff on it, you know, all fossil fuel derivatives, all of that stuff ends with side, you know, which is like also like suicide, homicide, genocide, you know, it like means death, right? So I was like, why do you want to put that on your food? You know what I'm saying? Dumb people put things that end with side on their food, right? I'm just saying like just some things at a certain point you got to say, wow, that's dumb. We just got to move on. You know, so that to me is what we do. So this is a corn variety I grow on the, on the uh, right side. It's a Bear Island Flint. So what I'd rather do, it's uh, how many corn, dry corn. It's like your corn's down here, twice the protein, half the calories. Rocks the B vitamins, never had a failure. Grows about this tall. Uh, first time I grew it, you know, I thought I failed. You know, I always tell the story. My father he came to see me once at Harvard and he said, you're a really smart young woman, Winona, but I don't want to hear your philosophy if you can't grow corn. <laughs> so then I worked really hard to be a corn grower. And I can grow corn, but I never had a crop failure. It only gr grows this tall. First I grew it, I thought I failed, and then I realized it just had to put on a head. You know, it just had to put on a corn cob. And uh, it's uh, frost resistant, and it's, uh, it's uh, drought resistant, and the big winds came through and they knocked over the Monsanto varieties, but ours stood. Plant for climate change. Plant for climate change. You know, people down here are really intelligent about that, but those are some of our varieties. This is what the future looks like in renewables. You know, that's what justice looks like for Standing Rock. You know, that tribe has a 50-year-old hospital. The road doesn't have a shoulder on it. Justice looks like infrastructure for people. You know, and that's what I want to see. People say renewable energy won't meet our present demand. And I say, why would you want to? <laughs> if you waste 57% of your energy between point of origin and point of consumption. You know, I know there's a lot of solar on these campuses, right? You know, efficiency is the answer. You know, and that's where the future is. And, uh, you know, this is where the investments are going. Even Shell is moving into renewables. So the reason I know this is all going to work out is a couple things. One is that I was uh, reading my Harvard magazine. I always laugh because they send me that with my, the appeal for the Harvard Fund every year since I graduated. I haven't given to the Harvard Fund yet, but maybe I will this year. But they send it. So you guys can look forward to that in your future if you're a student here. Every year you will get your appeal request. But I'm reading my Harvard magazine, and there's this woman named Mara Prentice on the cover. She's a physics professor, and she says, um, the reason the fossil fuel era is going to end is because of physics. She says that, um, she said that uh, the combustion engine in those cars that we all drove here in, a combustion engine is 16% efficient. Does that sound dumb or what? Between the drivetrain and, you know, like everything in there that moves reduces its efficiency as in physics. Now, an electric engine is 65% efficient. Cool. So when I was out in Washington, D.C. a few years ago, my sister and I, you've seen her, we were right, asked to ride our horses with the um, Cowboys and Indian Alliance opposing the Keystone Pipeline. And um, so we rode our horses, and I don't know if, most of you probably ride horse, or a lot of you do, but I don't know if, I'll just say one place you don't want to ride is Washington, D.C., <laughs> right? Because you're out there and there's like cops and, you know, banners and flashers and sirens. And I was like so terrified. I'm a super nervous rider. And uh, so we get there and we're riding our horses and I'm just praying the whole time that nothing bad will happen. And I get off my horse and I go to my teepee, which is on the Washington Mall. I should have a picture of my teepee, but that sounds cool anyway though, right? I get off my horse and go to my teepee on the Washington Mall. So that's what I did there. <laughs> I spend my time thinking of cool stuff to do, basically, which is true about half the time. It's like, yeah, let's do that. That sounds cool. Anyway, so um, I had our teepee at the Washington Mall, and the Lakotas all had their teepees. We'd had ours, but I, we had a really cool teepee. And so I'm in my teepee hanging out at the Washington Mall and, and um, with my two 15-year-old sons. 
and uh, cool people are coming to my teepee. Not when I'm there, but cool people are coming in when, you know, all the time. So like Neil Young is in my teepee, right? And Daryl Hannah's in my teepee, and like cool people are in the teepee, you know? And uh, so then I'm sitting in the teepee in the Washington Mall with my sons, and this guy comes and sticks his head in the teepee, and he says, um, Ms. LaDuke, would you like to go for a ride in my car? And my sons are like, no, mom. And I'm like looking at that guy going like, that's such a great pickup line from like the 1980s or something, buddy. I'm like, why do I want to go for a ride in your car? I don't know you, I, you know? You know, it's like, no. And I look at him and he says, it's a Tesla. And I was like, yes, I want to go for a ride in your car. <laughs> so I walked out of my teepee into a red four-door Tesla, right? I want to say that's basically what I want to do. That's called an elegant transition. Y'all got that? Y'all got that? And don't, don't go for second-rate stuff. That's what we want. You know, we want the cool thing. So, um, got to divest to get there. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures, then I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. So this is my village. This was in the movie called The Seventh Fire. Someone asked me about that today. And uh, this is a film. I didn't like this film, but it was kind of rough in my village. Took this picture, and so we were, we, you know, we said, we don't want to be those people, you know? And so uh, in my village, which nobody's going to fix for us, we looked around and we said, we started to do some stuff. So this is what we started. We took the tagged buildings. And we started painting. We got seven with murals on them. Kind of was based on the, I don't know, I got inspired in San Francisco in the mission, right? I was like, oh, I want to do that. So we did that. The solar at my house. We're putting solar panels, south-facing walls, to save 25% of our heating bill. Right, that's what my project does. That's a pretty cool house, huh? Yeah. Our water tower. And this is kind of what like doing it yourself looks like, right? A lot of volunteers, a lot of that. And um, you know, that's what ours, that's what we want to do. This is what we think energy just looks, looks like an area. This is uh, solar farms with a grid system on a reservation, you know? It's our idea, not their idea. This is what justice looks like in the tar sands. This is a woman named Melina, Mercu uh, Melina Lubicon. And um, this was her master's project. She put 20 kilowatts of solar up in her village that was a diesel generator powered village in the middle of the tar sands. Cool, huh? You know, I'm like, just do it. Just do it. That's my feeling, is if we could do it, anybody could. Okay, now this is your little video. I got off the horse and these guys got up. This is the yes man. We knew there was a way to pull the plug on big oil. Can you hear it? But we needed some help. Ever since we met Gitz, we wanted to do something together. Posing as government bigwigs, we would infiltrate a Homeland Security Conference and announced that the USA was outlawing fossil fuels and replacing them with renewables. And the best part? The new wind and solar power plants would be owned by native tribes as partial reparations for genocide. To actually have white people wearing bands that say native headdress instead of a feather, a windmill, this is us making fun of the American ideal of what it is to be Indian. This would truly be a second Thanksgiving. I told the conference that I represented General Colin Powell, and they were pumped to have him speak. So our speakers are running just a tad late. We're not going to worry about it. Uh, General Colin Powell is uh, coming to speak to us, and he's bringing a couple of colleagues. He's General Powell, of course, would not show up, but his colleagues were nearly there. Oh my god, you guys. <laughs> is this not going to be a total giveaway? No. Is there a way to like, you know, maybe make it a little less like it is? <laughs> <laughs> Who's the other person? Well, the Admiral, and he's, oh, he's and he's followed by the Deputy of the Secret Service. So you've oh. got two, like, exceedingly senior people. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, I'm going to just confirm with them because he's so late, I'm beginning to wonder what's going on. Hey, Zach, Mr. Benedict Gordon. Hi, Barbara Alexander. I'm so glad to meet you. Hello? Hi. I'm nervous. Me and Tito are sitting down. We're trying to make small talk. Have you ever tried yoga? 
No, not sure. I need to. I'm having a hard time finding the yoga pants that'll fit. Sean, I've been like I've never seen a He's a scientist. I don't know. That is a bad hair day. These guys weren't exactly tree hugging eco freaks. We had an aspiring Republican congressman, a two star general, lots of defense contractors, and weird security guards in trench coats. How would they react to an energy revolution? Our first speaker is um, Undersecretary of Policy Implementation at the Department of Energy, Mr. Benedict Waterman. On behalf of the Department of Energy, I'm very excited to announce today a great new plan that will do nothing less than convert the United States energy grid into one that's powered entirely by renewable sources. As the dire reality of climate change becomes more and more inescapable, people will take the future into their own hands. And historically, we know that popular resistance is a force that can only with difficulty be countervailed. A revolutionary energy program today is easier than a real revolution tomorrow. By 2030, America will produce 100% of our energy from renewables, establishing us once again as a global leader in confronting the supreme challenge of climate change. We're excited to be working with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and some of the largest tribes from Arizona to the Dakotas to site major wind and solar facilities that will provide a large chunk of America's power. The tribes will own these facilities. It will provide an enormous stimulus to the economy and great resilience in the face of future threats. It's time for a second Thanksgiving. I am Dana Slowhorse. I'm the director of industrial development for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. I am a member of the Wanabe Nation. Joining me is my nephew here. He's a fire chief, a war chief, a water chief, and he's actually also a midwife. He helps uh, young mothers. <laughs> long sort of history between the Americans and the indigenous peoples. It always hasn't been a beneficial relationship, at least not to us. <laughs> the first time we have a voice and we will own, truly own, this new energy production, and that's progress. <laughs> and it'll build a stronger economy, a brighter future. We will give something to our children. <laughs> But I actually went and killed a deer. I tanned the hide myself. Give you this gift. <laughs> we want this giant cave with our two peoples. Um, we want to acknowledge this for the round dance. And I encourage everybody to join us together. <laughs> Form a circle around all this is possible. All the way around. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, excuse me. I composed this song for this occasion. I made it a simple song so we can sing it together because it's not just my song, it belongs to all of us. Way out here.
be worthwhile, I think, get an opportunity to perhaps, uh, you know, chat with you or your staff. Absolutely. Where you deem appropriate. What kind of effect do you expect us to have on the share price of the next to that? This is ultimately going to benefit the economy tremendously. Great. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. What did the midwifery come about for you? So, uh, yeah, I have a lot of sisters and uh, a lot yeah. of grateful uh, nieces and nephews. Yeah, definitely. So we're a part of Northrop Grumman. Uh, we're a large business, but uh, very interested to see how we can support this novel cause. It's fantastic. I'm so excited. Yeah, this is outstanding. I feel really good. It's a very emotional day. Great. I was surprised to see someone from Northrop Grumman acting so excited. You weren't talking about weapons, you're talking about renewables. You know, surprisingly enough, most people are not megalomaniacally insane. <laughs> Even people who work for Northrop Grumman. And if they're given the opportunity, to uh, do what they actually believe in their hearts is the right thing, they go with it. The fact that we could get all these people that we think of as being from the dark side that dance in support of renewable energy is that there are very few people who actually want us to continue on this fossil fuel path. And we have to force our leaders to actually do what we need them to do. And then people will follow. Except for a few oil company execs. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget that song now, you sing it any time. <laughs>
and I think we need to face North Dakota down. Uh, there, you know, there are trials every week. There are 750 trials. Um, you know, people are, you know, and so I, I, so our website, Honor the Earth, or my staff started something called Fresh At, and I think that we're going to have a lot of the dates listed up there. Um, I'm going to, I'll just check with making sure there's a link on the Honor the Earth website. But, um, you know, we hired a, a bunch of lawyers. Um, you know, but to me, it's not just... Um, we still need more help on our legal defense, and we need help on our legal offense, because no one's been uh, charged with the um, the dog bite incident. You know what I'm saying is that you shouldn't be able to put your dogs on people. Uh, the water cannon case, it's not clear on that, but you know some people were seriously injured, and I I feel that North Dakota should be charged itself, or that someone in, that the use of excessive force. You know, and that hasn't happened. And so it's one of the hopes that, you know, we're working to, you know, be working on the, those cases too. But we will, we will see how that works. It's not just defense, it's also offense. Because I don't think you should be able to do that to people. You know. Um, and then just don't let them militarize all of, the, all of the police in your state. I mean, hold these guys accountable. Um, so that's what I would say. And then as we work on renewable energy, I've been, you know, some of the divest movement, divest, invest, the uh, big foundations are looking at investing in wind and solar on Standing Rock. And Standing Rock should get those projects, you know, because everybody is looking at Standing Rock, and so I'd like to see that happen. But, you know, there should be a lot of good projects in these other communities, too. So make your battles here, too. There are battles right here, you know. So, so I think we did want to acknowledge, you know, really what was happening. And, and in some ways, there was an effort to not share that information you know, uh, those of us that grew up in the 60s and 70s understood, you know, what was happening at that time. And being here at the university, it was really interesting to see our young people who had never really quite had that experience to the degree that our grandparents, our great-grandparents, or even our parents had. And, and to, to watch it occur on social media was really difficult for a lot of our students. And, and in many ways, we were encouraging our students to stay in school and the importance of being here, you know, we, we also want them to be protectors and on the front lines, but then we also try to help them understand that this is why they're in school. Um, so the, so, it, so it, it's difficult, and I think it was important for us to acknowledge what was occurring so that people, you know, and I think it even came after the election that people were just out of balance, you know, and, it, and, I, and I like the idea of just taking a breath. <laughs> You know, and, and sitting back, and that you know, we'll, we'll you know we're resilient. You know, we'll, we'll survive this. So, but given all of that that's going on, and, and your your courage, your experience, um, all those things that you've done over your time, and I know that you're not done yet. Is that one of the questions? Is do you um, have any examples of false reporting? I think they also call it now alternative news or uh, stories that affected you or your causes, and what tactics and strategies do you employ to anticipate and minimize its impact on your mission, and what advice would you have to those that are protectors and also organizing to take action as well? Yeah, that's a, I mean, there, it, it is all the time. You know, and I think that, I think that it was really important that, um, you know, we started using the term in, nor in northern Minnesota that we were protectors. Because uh, I'm not a protester, you know. I'm, um, and I, you know, I had this engagement about three years ago with actually a tribal chairwoman on one reservation, and she said, "You're protesting." I said, "I'm not protesting." You know, I said, "I'm here to protect the water," you know. And so I think it's really important to to claim the language, and to not be trivialized or minimalized as to who we are. And I really like that, you know, we call ourselves water protectors. I like it, and, and you know, one of the, like, a lot of us were inspired. There was tens of thousands of people that went there. And a lot of people were inspired by their courage, you know, and, and, and one day I was writing on my kitchen table and, and uh, trying to like mind my own business and write some article. I was like all happy. I was home and I look up and I have three grandsons there. <laughs> and one of them is wearing my dapple helmet, which is a, a snowmobile helmet with stickers on it, because I was like, they can't shoot me in the head with a rubber bullet, it'll be a big problem, you know? 
It's like I had a helmet for going to North Dakota, right? So one of my grandkids is wearing that. One has a, a gas mask on, and one has a bandana over his face. And they have like, like uh, pan lids, you know, for their shields. And they're like, we're water protectors, Granny. And I thought, there are tens of thousands of kids that are saying that right now. Let us encourage them. You know, let us make sure that our heroes are kept as heroes. You know? And so I just, you know, I, I just keep thinking about that. And, and in northern Minnesota, we don't have exactly the same problems in the media because we are correcting Enbridge all the time. They'll put out something and we'll say, no, that's not right. And so, you know, but we, we are winning the media battle because people have seen what's happened. But in North Dakota, you know, they just put out this big media spin on the, the you know, the garbage of the water protectors. They totally packaged that and it was, you know, really misspun. You know, and I, I wrote a story for the Fargo paper called The Filth of North Dakota. And I was like, let's just talk about filth. Like the 40,000 pounds of Rosol that that guy, like one guy bought, which is like a, it's a prairie dog poison. 40,000 pounds of Rosol. And he broadcast it all over the Cannonball Ranch and all over another ranch to kill the prairie dogs. And then you aren't supposed to broadcast it, you're supposed to put it in their prairie dog houses or whatever but he broadcast it and so then the prairie dogs died and then the eagles ate the prairie dogs and they died. And then the buffalo died, right? So it's like, let's talk about garbage, North Dakota. Let's talk about pollute, you know what I'm saying? Do not put that on us because you're the people who do that, you know? You're the, you know? And so I think it's really important to, to always counter them and you have to keep at it all the time. Their spin is toxic and their spin is wrong. And I think people are now like far more aware now that the, you know, not that other presidents haven't been using alternative facts, but the alternative facts of this president are really amazing. You know, this collection of alternative facts or whatever, right? So do you ever get tired of fighting? Where do you, de do you derive your power to persist and how do you recharge? Well, today I was a little tired because I got up at 3.45 a.m. I just want y'all know, so that's why I'm a little bit tired today. I was like, I need a nap. Um, but um, you know, you know, yes and no. I mean, I'm, I am, um, I live a good life. You know, I live a good life like a lot of the other Native people here. I live, you know, in the lake in the middle of the woods on my reservation where my great 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 greats harvested wild rice. You know, I could still drink the water. I could look out there on the lake and I could see the swans and you know, I could see everything that means everything to me is right there. And uh, I, I get to go to my ceremonies, you know, I get to go dance, I get to, you know, I, I got horses, so I have a good life, you know, and what I want is, like I feel like the creator, in our language it's called minobamadaziwin, which means a good life, and that's his covenant I have with the creator. That's the life I'm supposed to have, and that's what I want, and these guys, these corporations are interrupting my good life. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so I'm like, you're not gonna do that. I'm gonna push you back, because I'm gonna keep this life, you know, it's good. And so just do that. And then, you know, every once in a while, I just, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's good. I just, you know, you gotta make sure you balance yourself. And then think about, you know, how privileged we are. You know, we're all really first world, you know? You know, my crisis is like my cell phone didn't get charged, right? I mean, get real. We're all super privileged bunch by and large, right? And our stuff is like nowhere near. Like sometimes my kids are whining, I'm like, well, good thing you ain't in Syria, right? You know what I'm saying? It was like, get real. And all of us seen a lot of people had went through a lot of hardships, like, you know? I knew Roberta Blackcoat, you know? People had some hard times up here. So, you know, we remember that. So I'm like, let's be appreciative you know, about things, and then plus, like, we're just way cooler than them. That's why I like that yes man thing. It's like, we are so funny, <laughs> and we're so cool, like, you know, so just make sure you do entertaining things all the time, you know. Yeah, Enbridge is really afraid of what we're going to do to them next, because, you know, we did, we, we did a whole video called The Indian Whisperer on them, which is based on a yes man video. They were, and when they hired their Indian Whisperers, I said, did you see that video? He said, yes. He hung his head. He said, yes, they made us watch it. So just, just think of conniving things to do to the enemy all the time. It's fun. So we are in a university environment. And, and again, I think that we certainly take pride in, in, 
in what we can do for our students, native, non-native. We, we know that it's a system that sometimes you know, can be challenging. As you mentioned, you know, uh, uh, Koch Brothers has a couple of centers here. And those of us that work you know, in, in the role of, um, at least in my job, you know, as, as a uh, assistant vice president of tribal relations and in working with my counterparts at NAU and U of A, we, you know, we talk about the fact that sometimes we spend as much time protecting our tribal communities from universities as we do from uh, advocating on behalf of universities. But, but the fact of the matter is that we've, we've come a long ways in terms of what education can do for our Native students. And with that in mind, what, what reforms would you uh, recommend in terms of educational systems that would most impact addressing environmental issues and indigenous rights from your perspective? I was, I was just really pleased to be at the Sustainability Institute today and this intersection between sustainability and the indigenous community that was there. That's, I mean, that's basically the answer. You know, a lot of it is contained within that. But then also, to be honest, I mean, you know, I'm, you know, I'm an economist by training, and, you know, the business model that is still dished out in these schools is not an appropriate business model for the world that we live in. It was actually never an appropriate business model, to tell you the truth. Like, if you're going to pretend that there's a never-ending access to resources, and that, you know, you look at something like the fossil fuel industry, and they say that there's... Uh, 5,785 gigatons of carbon held by the Koch brothers and Exxon and Peabody and all those guys, 5,785 gigatons of carbon is what they hold. And in a business school here, business school anywhere will tell you, we'll, we'll call that a reserve, it's called a reserve. Or it's called an asset of the corporation. But the reality is, is that in order to keep the planet from combusting, we can only we can only uh, burn about 550 gigatons of carbon, one-tenth of what those guys hold as assets. And so what I say is that that is actually a liability. It's not an asset. And so, you know, I could say you can kind of pepper your school with the flavor of your school with a little indigenous here and there, or you can challenge the paradigm that continues to cause the destruction of the earth. And I think that it is incumbent upon enlightened schools to reevaluate how the business is taught. And, you know. So one last, uh, one last question and then I have a gift for you. So what do you think it means uh, that a large portion of the people that were camping at Standing Rock were non-natives and does this signify a turning point in relationships between Native Americans and, and uh, white Americans or, you know, America at large? That's a really funny question. I mean, I think there's a couple of things because, the, you know, I, the, the youth of this country, I love them. You know, they are alive. They are awake. They reject, you know, a lot of what has been shoved down their throats by this system. They reject the racism. You know, they reject the paradigm of the capitalism. They reject, you know, and so they, you know, they, they are alive and they want to, they, they are very courageous. You know, I had, I had three Standing Rock refugees at my house, two girls that were 20 year old girls from Philadelphia with felony charges. I love those girls, you know. I was like, I'm gonna get you girls a lawyer. You know, the public defenders wouldn't return their calls, right? You know, and I just love those girls. But to me, that's, you know, that's like great. You know, that's why they wanted to support that. And then I have to be super honest, I was like, about half of them were probably like, we get to go hang out with the Lakotas? We get to go there? You know, I know they were like, can we go? I was like, yes, you can go. Pack your own stuff though, we ain't feeding y'all, but you know. You know, so I think that there was that whole thing, too. It's like, you know, anybody who was up there, it was like this moment, you know, it was a great moment. I'm just going to leave with this one quote where, you know, I'm, I've been really privileged in my life, and I've hung out with a lot of really awesome people. And uh, I hope to continue doing that. But once as a very young woman, I was about 18, I got to sit with two Oglala chiefs, and one of them was Frank Fool's Crow, and the other one was Matthew King. 
and the two of the traditional Oglala headsmen. And I was, uh, in the, I was outside with them and they were, you know, they were there and I was listening to them. And I remember this one thing that Matthew King said that I'm never gonna forget. And what he said is, the only thing sadder than an Indian who isn't free is an Indian who doesn't remember what it's like to be free. I was like, that's it. You know, because to me, Standing Rock was like, we all remembered what it was like to be free, right? And once people remember that, they ain't going back. You know, and to me, that's a lot of what I felt there. I really felt that. And I, I, I don't want to, I'm not going to forget. You know, and so I don't want any of us to forget. Because it's our chance to be fully human. You know, and whatever that means. So, anyway, thank you. Let's, let's give uh, Manolo did one more round of applause. For and I have a gift here. And uh, before I do that, I also want to thank the School of Sustainability, uh, the Global Institute of Sustainability, and all those that have helped organize uh, this whole day and for this evening's event. So earlier this week, I had the opportunity to take one of our deans up to uh, uh, Window Rock and Salee out to Diné College and then over to Hopi. And I, I really appreciated the fact that this dean wanted to go out and see what it's like in a tribal community. Even though we have educators, we have paradigms within the university, it's interesting to see that transition in terms of what they thought it was and what really, what it's like, you know, to, to understand how much learning, how much more learning that you can learn outside of an institution. Um, and out in the community. So as part of that tour, uh, Regent Leonard, who had just stepped down from the, the Board of Regents, um, she's Hopi, uh, Luann Leonard, she gave us a tour of their education and their Head Start programs, and also up to um, the village of um, Walpi. And so uh, while we were there, this is one of, the, uh, along with Old Araibi, one of the oldest, um, continuous uh, living communities um, in the United States, well, in, in North America. And so while we were walking around, there was a, a, a grandfather and a grandson sitting outside their house and they had uh, some of their uh, arts and crafts and so this seemed to be the perfect place and perfect time. I was gonna get you a different box, but I really like this cool box. So um, I promise you it's not a size eight shoe. Um, it's a nice little shoe box. Um, I probably could have got something nicer, and then I'll get you a better box if you need one before you travel home. So it's got, um, we have napkins in here to help uh, protect this, but we have a kachina from, uh, <laughs> from Hopi, and this is uh, Mother Earth. So for you. So again, one more round of applause and thank you for coming out this evening. This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Global Institute of Sustainability for educational and non-commercial use only.